October 12, 1969, two Soviet cosmonauts released the air from Soyuz 6, their spacecraft. As the lifeless vacuum sets in, Valery Kubasov, one of those cosmonauts, begins an experiment that will echo through history. Welcome to Future Fox. I'm glad you're here. Technology is boring, by itself. But the people who build it and use it make it interesting. On this channel, you and I will explore the broader social context around emerging technologies. And today, we're looking at space factories. Now, back to Valery. He and his partner retreat to the descent module in case something goes wrong. Once in safety, Valery pushes a remote control button. In the main module, an experimental device comes to life. Inside of its chamber are two pieces of metal, a bright spark. An electric arc welds the metals together in a flash. It doesn't seem like much at that time, but that experiment proves that we can build things directly in space. That event starts another lap in the US-Soviet space race. Four years later, NASA responded by launching Skylab. It became the United States' first permanent outpost in the low Earth orbit, one that was dedicated to exploring the scientific possibilities of space. Skylab survived for only one year, but astronauts managed to perform five experiments in space fabrication during that short time. Their findings gave birth to a whole new research field. As it turns out, substances mix incredibly evenly in microgravity. On Earth, gravity pulls down heavier atoms and molecules. This creates imperfections in the structure of metal alloys, semiconductor crystals, and even pharmaceuticals. This effect is called gravity-induced sedimentation. And the more delicate the stuff that we're trying to make, the more severe the impact of those imperfections. Microgravity is not the only advantage of space fabrication. The vacuum of space helps to avoid the impurities often introduced by the Earth's atmosphere. Since Soyuz 6 and Skylab missions, the science of manufacturing in microgravity and in vacuum has been improving steadily. But despite our scientific progress, most discoveries in that field have never translated into any practical applications. Until recently. Q4 2019, it was the first time that a Falcon 9 landed four times. And that to me was like the rough breaking point of like, if they can do it four times, they can definitely do it 40, which makes the economics of space like wildly different. That was Dalana Sparhov, co-founder of Varda Space. He's one of the few entrepreneurs who noticed not only the decrease in cost of launches, thank you, SpaceX, but also the growing commercial interest in space manufacturing. Andrew Bacon, co-founder and chief technology officer of the UK-based Spaceforge, shares Asparakov's thesis. What we are trying to do is to build a factory in space, to make new materials that you cannot make on Earth. The seemingly overnight explosion in space manufacturing has been in the making for about 70 years now. In 1954, Gordon Kidd Teal from Texas Instruments made a breakthrough that started it all. He invented the world's first silicon transistor. Soon enough, integrated circuits and microchips followed. Our ability to manipulate matter on the molecular and atomic levels made it possible. You're probably starting to see how space manufacturing fits here. Since the 50s, we doubled the transistor density every other year. But each leap in density placed stricter requirements on the purity and quality of silicon crystals. Making computer chips today requires insanely sophisticated machinery, just like this $120 million monster from ASML. Such machines rely on vacuum pumps to create environments free of contaminants. The higher the vacuum, the more expensive it is to make it. But in space we can access vacuum that is thousands of times higher than in a typical semiconductor facility. For comparison, that's the kind of vacuum we create at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN and it would be prohibitively expensive for regular industry applications. Semiconductor researchers began experimenting with orbital manufacturing in the early 90s. Under the leadership of NASA and the University of Houston researcher Alex Ignatiev, we produced ultra-thin, pure semiconductor films for the first time in 1994. The results were incredible. Ignatiev was beaming with optimism. Ten years downstream, he said, we should have products coming out. The pharmaceutical industry followed a similar trajectory. Pharma companies now pour billions of dollars in nanomedicine, new drug delivery systems, and stem cell research. And they, too, have space in their sights. 
Paul Reichardt from the Merck Research Laboratory is pioneering the space fabrication of pharmaceuticals and proteins. Over the past three decades, the astronauts at the International Space Station have completed countless experiments under Reichardt's guidance. Ignatiev, Reichardt, and hundreds of others have proven that orbital fabrication is key to faster technological progress. But year in and year out, scaled commercial applications remain just 10 years away, a moving target. Since then, we we'll learned to work around the limitations imposed by our planet's gravity and atmosphere. But it almost feels like we've given up on space. Thankfully, a new crop of space startups is here to upset the terrestrial status quo. As we try to make things at a commercial scale in space, many engineering challenges become apparent. The re-entry process is one of the biggest of them by far. During descent, we often mangle and outright destroy the delicate goods we make in orbit. Two factors make safe return difficult. First, there is the heat. Atmospheric friction upon re-entry heats up the space vehicle up to several thousand degrees Celsius. Typically, we solve this with something called ablative heat shields. It's basically a layer of resin that covers the outside of a spacecraft. It evaporates during re-entry and carries the excess heat away. But ablative heat shields are expensive and must be replaced after every landing. Second, various physical forces could affect the payload. Spacecraft experience massive deceleration during re-entry and landing. We're talking up to 5 Gs of force. The delicate products we make in space are simply not built to sustain such loads. If you're SpaceX and you actually focus on sending stuff into the orbit in bulk, that's a small problem. But if you're a tiny startup bringing things back down to Earth safely and at scale, you must rethink how you build descent modules. Not only they must protect the final products, they must be cheap to make and operate. And that's the bread and butter of Spaceforge. Led by CTO Andrew Bacon, the company built a reusable re-entry system to ensure soft landing for any delicate payload. Instead of using ablative heat shields, they engineered a heat sink that unfolds like a heat umbrella during descent. Not only it dissipates the excess thermal energy, but it also helps to decelerate the capsule gently. The team also developed an uncrewed water vehicle called Fielder. It casts a net under the descent module to catch it and provide soft landing. Both the descent module and the fielder vehicle are fully reusable. These capabilities attracted influential players from the semiconductor industry, and Intel is one of them. So far, Spaceforge has been focusing on the return logistics of the products made in orbit. Varda Space, on the other hand, has bigger goals. Not only did the company build a re-entry system, they also built a fully reusable space factory. Daliana Sparakov said that Varda aims to become a Foxconn in space, and they are on track to achieving that. According to Varda, several notable semiconductor and pharma companies have already signed up to manufacture computer components and bioactive compounds at Varda's orbital facilities. A lot of our customers are actually kind of like household names. Uh, we're just further back. We're kind of what I call like the contract manufacturer for space. Varda Space has recently secured the follow-on round of funding to finance R&D. And notably, they also purchased four reusable rockets from a fellow startup Rocket Lab. And that's not the only good news. In June this year, Varda successfully grew crystals of ritonavir, a drug used to treat HIV. Space drugs have finished cooking, tweeted Delian. But even with the impressive track records of Spaceforge and Varda Space, success is anything but certain. Earlier this year, Spaceforge partnered with Virgin Orbit to test their system. But it didn't go as planned. The rocket's engine shut down prematurely and plummeted into the Atlantic. This was a massive setback for the team. But they are now ready for another test launch later this year. Meanwhile, Varda Space is a little closer to the finish line. However, as of the moment of filming, their cargo is still stuck in orbit. We're yet to see whether they landed successfully. While Varda Space and Spaceforge are the two best-known space fabrication startups, they are not the only players in the field. And if they don't succeed, someone else will. Venture funding in private space tech companies has accelerated to 16 billion in 2021. Flush with cash, a new ambitious crop of startups is working on everything from space robotics to solar farms to optical fibers. We are now in a transition from space exploration to space commercialization. Some even call it the orbital age. And as Spaceforge, Varda Space and others race to build space factories, we can now explore how they could change our lives. So far, orbital fabrication of pharmaceuticals has attracted most of the commercial attention. But the fabrication of semiconductors in space could have a greater long-term impact on the future of humanity, both here on Earth and off-world. Here's how this could work and what it could lead to. 
we will launch several facilities into orbit. One will produce ultra-thin semiconductor panels that are efficient at converting solar energy into electricity. Another will 3D print structural scaffolds for those panels. And the third will act as a warehouse and will also host autonomous robots for assembly and maintenance operations. Those facilities will form the backbone of our factory that will make solar panels ready to be integrated into a larger orbital solar power plant. A space tug, like this one from Firefly Aerospace, will pull the finished rig to the required orbit. There, robot workers will assemble the panels into vast solar arrays, each several miles in diameter. The orbital power plant is ready to beam the energy down to a receiver on Earth. A single one-mile-wide solar array could generate 2 gigawatts of power. For comparison, the United States adds 28 gigawatts of power generating capacity every year. Only 14 power plants in space could satisfy that demand. It sounds like science fiction. The technology is nascent, and we still lose a lot of power when transferring it over the air. But the United Kingdom plans to launch a pilot orbital power plant by 2035. Now let's zoom out. Civilizational transitions in human history happened on the heels of breakthroughs in energy extraction and conversion. From horses, to hydrocarbons, to nuclear and renewables, each new method of power generation created downstream paradigm shifts in technology and society. Orbital solar power is a possible next step. In theory, it could help us harness more of the energy that reaches our planet. And this is a tantalizing idea. In 1964, Soviet astronomer Nikolai Kardashev suggested a way to rank civilizations based on their level of energy extraction. According to Kardashev, a Type 1 civilization can harness all of the energy that reaches its home planet from its parent star. And following that definition, humanity is a Type 0. But within our lifetime, we will find out whether we have what it takes to make the shift from 0 to 1. Companies like Spaceforge, Varda Space, and many others are betting their future on that. And I hope that the pioneers of space fabrication like Alex Ignatiev and Paul Reichert get to see the fruit of their labor. It's just 10 years away. This time for real. Thank you for watching. Please like this video and subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. And see you next time. Oh, you're still here. You know, as I was doing the research for this video, I actually found a way to buy silicon wafers made in space online. What a time to be alive, eh? Buy for real this time.